Welcome to the Communication Diva Podcast, episode 150. On today's podcast, Jen speaks with Mac Pritchard about the best places to look for that great new job. Wait a second. I'm supposed to look for a job? Oh... Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 150, and this is the very last episode that is going to be called the Communication Diva Podcast. I'm a little bit sad about that, but don't go anywhere because on this very same feed, wherever you're getting your podcasts, the show will continue to come to you. Number episode 151 will come next time, and it will have a different name and a different uh, logo, different artwork. But the same great content, it is going to be called Careers by Jen, and it will be the Careers by Jen podcast, and you will find the website and everything moved over to careersbyjen.com. If you still go to communicationdiva.com, it will redirect you. I'm uh, I'm having lots of technological fun right now, so if it doesn't look exactly like it should, if there are glitches here and there and things that don't work, I'm working on it. I've got people helping me, and uh, I'm hoping to have it all sorted out in very short order. So uh, a little patience, please, and I'm hoping that uh, it'll all be great by the time I finish doing all of that. Anyhow, today I am excited to bring you a very special guest. Mac Pritchard is a person that I met last summer at the uh, podcast movement in Anaheim and uh, got to meet him and his wonderful team. And I have been a guest on his show, and I am so delighted that he is here to share his wisdom with us today. Mac is the founder and publisher of Max List, which is an online community for people looking for rewarding, creative, and meaningful work. More than 80,000 people a month visit the site, which includes a job board, a blog, and courses about the nuts and bolts of job hunting and career management. A leading career expert, Mac helps people who are looking for a job during all of life's transitions, millennials getting a first job, midlife professionals switching sectors, parents getting back to work after raising a family, or baby boomers who want to change careers. Mac is proud to own two registered B Corp companies, which use the power of markets to solve social and environmental problems. And he is the author of Land Your Dream Job Anywhere and hosts the weekly podcast, Find Your Dream Job. So we have a lot in common. We do a lot of the same work. And and so I'm delighted to bring you our topic today, which is the best places to find that great new job. So I'll turn you over to my conversation with Mac Pritchard. So welcome to the show, Mac. Well, it's a pleasure to be on the program, Jen. It's fabulous to have you here. I know you're a busy guy and you've got lots going on, but I, I want to start off by asking you to tell us a little bit about how you came to be doing what you're doing. Well, I run two small businesses. One is a public relations company that works with foundations, nonprofits, and purpose-driven brands. And uh, we do that. Uh, we're based in Portland, Oregon, in the West Coast of the U.S., but we work with clients across the the country. The other is an online community. It's called maxlist.org, and it's a place for people looking for rewarding creative work. There's a job board there with about 500 job listings a month, a blog, um, uh, a podcast, books, courses, all about how to find rewarding, meaningful work. And I'm kind of an accidental entrepreneur, Jen. I, I'm, I'll be 59 this month, and I started my career and spent most of my working life as a communications professional working in politics, government, and nonprofits here in the United States. And the common denominator that ran through all the different kinds of jobs I had, I was a speechwriter to a governor, a city hall communications director for a mayoral candidate, a human rights activist working for a nonprofit that took uh, legislators to Central America way back in the 80s. 
But the common denominator was trying to make a difference about issues I care about or in the community where I live and work or ideally both. And the companies I have now uh, allow me to, to do that. And, and they're actually, uh, in hindsight, a very natural progression to uh, what I set out to do when I started my career 35 years ago, which was to make a difference. And you're making a difference because you've got uh, a lot of people in your job, your, your, uh, your max list. We do. Uh, our website attracts about 40,000 unique visitors a month. And most of those are in the Pacific Northwest, in Oregon and Washington states here in the U.S. Uh, our weekly podcast, which we publish on Wednesdays, it's called Find Your Dream Job. And it uh, attracts uh, most of our downloads are outside of our home state of Oregon. Uh, and uh, 25% of them are overseas. And people, what that demonstrates to me is people are hungry for what uh, 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 we offer, and, and you do as well, Jen, which is advice about uh, how to have satisfying, rewarding careers, and how, and, but also practical tips about how to get that next job. Yeah, I think it's the, the practical tips that, uh, that are really, people are really looking for in all manner of places. And today we wanted to talk about uh, how to start, you know, if you want to get a new job, if you're thinking about making a career change, if you're looking for work after not having worked for a long time, any of those situations, where do you even begin to try and find a job? It's a great question. I think most people because the majority of us haven't had formal training in how to look for work, we think the way to do it is to sit down at the computer and look at a job board. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm in my 50s. I remember when the uh, instead of computers, we had newspapers, but the approach was the same. We would look at classified ads. And we, we most people think that you find a posting online uh, for something you could do or might interest you, fire off an application, and then you wait for a response. There are a lot of big problems with that approach. Uh, that's not how most jobs get filled. Uh, and if, if that's your strategy, chances are you're going to get frustrated and you're going to get stuck. Uh, there's a better way uh, to find a job. And, it, and the first step is to be clear about what you want and what, in, what interests you. Know uh, what you have to offer. And then finally, you need to look at job boards, but you also have to know this, that as many as 80% of the jobs out there, Jen, are never posted publicly on any job board. They're filled by word of mouth. Uh, and you need to look at how you spend your time. Too many people spend 100% of their time responding to publicly posted uh, job advertisements. Uh, and they should look at those ads, uh, whether they're online or in a newspaper. But that part of their job search should probably only take up about 20, 30, maybe 40% of their time. The rest of their time, they have to look for what are called hidden jobs. These are the jobs that never get posted. And there are specific strategies we can talk about that people can use to, to find and get those jobs. So why aren't these jobs posted, just, just out of curiosity? It's a great question. Sometimes people think there's a conspiracy here. Or <laughs> you, yeah, or you have to have gone to, I don't know, a Ivy League college or some elite university to, to, uh, or know a secret handshake with a hiring manager. But here's what's happening. There's no conspiracy. Hiring is risky, and it's expensive. And if you get it wrong, it's a costly mistake. So you go out, you find somebody, and it's, often it takes three to six months to know whether it's not a good fit. Uh, and, and then if you let that person go, you got to start all over again. And it can take one, three, even six months to fill the most senior jobs. So if you get it wrong, you have lost half a year, maybe a year or more, and you've probably lost tens of thousands of dollars as an employer. So keep that in mind. It's, it's, it's expensive and it's time consuming if you get it wrong. So how do people manage risk? What hiring managers do is this. They, they turn to people they trust, uh, typically uh, people they've worked with in the past or they know well or maybe even not so well, uh, and they consider them as candidates. And then the other thing that they do, Jen, is they, they turn to that same network 
uh, and ask for recommendations. Because if you've worked with somebody or they're sent by someone you trust to know, uh, you, you're going to feel more confident about their prospects as a candidate. And again, your your aim here is not to take care of your buddy, it's to to manage risk. And so our challenge when we're looking for jobs is we need to be part of those conversations that are happening. And there are specific steps people can take to, to make that happen so that they get uh, they they put themselves into that hidden job market as well. And so you, these you will never see posted because they're not union jobs. They're not jobs that require posting. They are jobs that can be hired right into by, by the hiring managers without having to go through that formal process then. Correct. And even, uh, and you're, I'm so glad you brought this up because there are jobs that must be posted publicly. Often they're in government, um, Sometimes they're so high profile in, in the private sector that they're they're publicly posted. Uh, there, there may be just rules that require it to happen. But even with these publicly posted jobs, there's an informal hiring process. Uh, and the uh, resumes are still being collected. People are still being selected for interviews. And so you may go in through the front door with a formal application, say, for a government job. But the candidate who has uh, made connections inside that organization before the position was posted is going to have an advantage over the people who are coming in cold. Now, it's not going to get them the job, but it's going to increase their their odds of success uh, because if they have those relationships, it's going to give them insights into the problems that that employer has. And uh, the more you know about an employer's challenges, the more successful you're going to be as a candidate because companies hire people to solve problems. Most candidates, um, the most successful candidates understand that and they walk into that interview room with ideas about how to make that employer's life easier. And that's going to give them an edge in the interview process. Absolutely. I talk about that in my in my interview course as well. So you've talked about some specific strategies or steps that people can take if they're tired of sitting in front of their computer typing job search things into Google, what can they do to find these hidden jobs? Well, three things. Uh, One is, again, you've got to be clear about your goal, where you want to work or the kind of work you want to do. And once you know that, then there are three main strategies that I've seen candidates have success with. One is uh, informational interviews. And These are conversations, Jen, where you sit down with someone who can tell you about the occupation you want to work in or the field you uh, want to be part of, and uh, and you want to do three things in an informational interview. And these conversations typically run 20 or 30 minutes. The the first thing you want to do is share your story, your goals, and, um, and basically introduce yourself. So the person knows who you are, what you offer, and, and, and what you're looking for. The second thing you want to do in these meetings is ask specific questions about the field that interests you, maybe a, a, a companies where you'd like to work, or maybe you're changing from the corporate to the nonprofit sector. You need advice about how to make that switch. You want to ask three to five focused questions that the person you're meeting with can, has insights into. And the third thing you want to do is ask for recommendations about other people you can meet uh, uh, who can help with your search. Because our challenge when we're looking for work is we need to understand the needs of employers. We need to uh, let people in our network and the networks of our networks know who we are and what we're looking for. And we need to grow our networks. And a good uh, informational interview lets you accomplish that. Um, The other two things you can do is uh, attend industry events, and again, knowing what your your career goals are, you can identify associations uh, or professional groups in that world and start uh, connecting with or or uh, or growing and expanding your network professionally. And the third thing you can do is volunteer in your industry, uh, because when you volunteer with people, you show you show the leaders in your world uh, what you can do. You build relationships and you grow your network. And you start to hear about hidden jobs, the unadvertised jobs, and your name starts to come up in those conversations. 
So it's about building relationship, it sounds like. It is. It's about building relationships. The more people you know, and you don't have to know them very well, uh, the more you will learn about opportunities at the companies or in the field where you want to work. And the easier it'll be for you to get in to see the hiring managers uh, at those organizations or in those fields. Typically, I find, Jen, I, I expect you have this experience too. Uh, you know, you talk to a job candidate and they'll say, gosh, I would really love to work at fill in the blank. You know, popular companies here in the Pacific Northwest or places like Microsoft or Nike or in the nonprofit world, there's an international uh, relief group based here in Portland called Mercy Corps. And, and, and so my next question is always, well, who have you talked to over there? And uh, often the answer is, well, gosh, nobody, but I look at their website every week and I'm waiting for a job posting to come up. And I, I respect that. And it is good. You need to look at the job at the website uh, for those publicly posted jobs. But you also, if you know where you want to go, you need to tell people that and you need to start building relationships with people inside that organization. Uh, don't wait for something to pop up on a on a job board because then you'll be competing with 50, 100, maybe several hundred applications. And the people who already have existing relationships with employers are going to have an edge over those who don't. So if you are someone who knows absolutely no one at the organization you're interested in, how open are people to answering emails and talking to potential candidates about you know and and setting up these uh, informational interviews how open are they i mean it feels it feels like it might be a bit daunting or it might feel a bit risky to for the person to put themselves out there so i just wonder how receptive people are to to giving of their time it's a great question and as with any new skill when you first practice it you're you're going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to be outside of your comfort zone. Uh, and uh, if you, uh, but people will say yes to these meetings, to informational interviews, uh, if you are specific about what you want and clear about your expectations for the meetings. Um, when people say no, I find it's because the, the person who made the request wasn't clear about what they wanted. So, Let's talk about practical steps. When you ask for an informational interview, two phrases you need to avoid are, can we get together for coffee or can I pick your brain? And those are all well-intentioned requests, but here's the problem uh, when, you, when you say the, you use those phrases. What the listener hears is an unfocused request for what could be 30, 40, maybe even 90 minutes of time. It's not clear what the outcome of the conversation is. So they're likely to ignore it uh, and hope that the request doesn't come again or perhaps even say no. What people who are busy, uh, who make the time to, to take these meetings, do respond positively to is a request that's very focused. And it might be a short email like this, Jen. It might say, the subject line might say, writing at the suggestion of Jen Swanson. And the email might say, uh, Jen Swanson suggested I, I contact you. I'm exploring opportunities in public relations in, in uh, Vancouver. I'm currently living in Seattle. I'm going to be in, uh, in Vancouver uh, uh, December 1st through the 7th. I wonder if you might have 15 to 30 minutes to meet. I'd like to talk about uh, my interest in working in uh, uh, nonprofit communications in Vancouver. I'm moving there with my spouse in March of next year. Uh, I'm available on the following dates um, uh, during my visit and uh, and time. And uh, I I look I I would welcome um, the opportunity to sit down and talk to you about opportunities in the field and other people I might chat with. That's a very specific request. Uh, it's clear who sent you. Uh, you've laid out dates when you're going to be in town. You've explained why you're coming, what you hope to get from the meeting, and uh, and you're you put limits on the the length of the meeting. Uh, and I find people who make requests like that uh, uniformly get a positive response. And if they don't hear back right away, they follow up a week later. And typically, uh, 
people don't respond because they're busy. Uh, emails get, uh, you know, they just, they're behind. But uh, they will say yes to people who are focused and persistent. Yeah, that sounds like it would be, it would be far easier to answer an email like that than it would to answer one that was rather vague uh, from the, the person who was being emailed from their perspective. Yeah. And I would also add to your earlier point, why would busy people say yes? Uh, it's because almost all, all of us, Jen, want to be of help to others. And our challenge, uh, and if we ignore a request or we say no, it's because, in my experience, we just haven't been clear about how people can help us. We need to make it easy for them to say yes. So making a, a limited... Um, uh, focused request that's specific about what the, about the actions you want the other person to, to make makes it easy for them to say yes. And that's what we as job seekers need to do when we're out there looking to grow our professional networks and tap into this hidden job market. That's really helpful. If a person is not, not, you know, not sure who to contact in an organization to even send an email to, yeah. What do you suggest there? Well, again, it comes back to your goals. So typically I find um, uh, job seekers have in their heads two or three goals that they want to explore or three to five, a short list of three to five companies or nonprofits where they'd like to work. So write it down, share it with others, and then so you know where you want to go when you do that. Then the, your next step is to find people who can help you. And thanks to the internet, there's no shortage of places to look. I, I've found for the job seekers I talk to say they have the most success with several sources. One, of course, is LinkedIn. Um, and if they want to uh, reconnect with somebody in a particular company or nonprofit, they go to LinkedIn and they see if they have any first degree connections there. And if not, they look for second degree connections and ask for introductions. Another place to look is um, uh, university or college databases, alumni databases, rather. Uh, you, most, particularly large universities, will have grads in, uh, uh, in uh, the major companies in, in your hometown. And uh, grads will always make time to, to talk to other graduates from the same college. You just uh, It's shocking to me, actually, how rarely those databases get used. I I went to two great universities um, in the U.S. One was the University of Iowa in my home state. The other was Harvard, where I got my graduate degree. And at Harvard, they teach us to use these databases and to do this kind of networking. And uh, to be fair to Iowa, I didn't go by the career services office, so maybe they taught that too. But um, you know, it just wasn't part of the DNA at the at the public university. But there are so many great graduates from Iowa that I've discovered since then. So it, you don't, again, have to have gone to an Ivy League school to tap into a fabulous network. So I, would, I recommend starting with LinkedIn and, and, and your university database. It sounds like all of this takes time. It does, yeah. It does. And so think about time and think about the person who's sitting down at that computer and they find the job that they're, they might be qualified for, kind of mildly interests them. They don't know anyone there. And they do, so they sit down and they write a, cust, uh, a cover letter and they, and, they make, and they customize it. Then they take their resume and they tweak it a little bit uh, for that particular position. And then they might have to fill out a, uh, an online application form. So if you're doing an application right, uh, if you're you know, not just firing things off, you're probably spending, I don't know, two uh, hours on each application. Uh, that's about how much time it takes you to set up and do an informational interview, Jen. And I, I speak from personal experience here. I, I grew up in the Midwest. I lived on the East Coast in the U.S. Um, in my 20s. And, and I moved to my home state now of Oregon 25 years ago. And I made the choice to come out here while I was in graduate school in January, between January and June, during a six-month period, I probably did 100 informational interviews. Um, and I got uh, three or four, I probably advertised for five jobs, um, and I got several offers before I took one at City Hall here in Portland. Uh, but my point is this, 
during that same six month period, somebody who's only doing job boards, uh, responding to job board announcements might spend all week, you know, 30 or 40 hours sending out applications. And they might hear back maybe from a third with uh, either rejection notes or maybe uh, and a, a small number, maybe five or 10 might offer them interviews. And they might get two or three offers. Here's the point I'd like to make. It took me the same amount of time to do those informational interviews as it did the, for the person who's sending out job applications. But at the end of that process, Jen, I had a network of more than 100 people here in Oregon in the communications world uh, that I built from scratch from 2,300 miles away. And I keep running across those people every year uh, because I work in that world. Uh, if you're responding to job postings, you're not creating a network. And uh, chances are you're not going to hear back from any of the people, even the ones that you interviewed with. So uh, the amount of time is about the same as a job board only strategy. But the benefits are are so much greater because, again, it's about relationships. It's about growing networks. And if you build a network, uh, it will continue to serve you for years to come. And the other great thing about that that came to mind while you were speaking is that in the end, after you had been offered several different positions, you had choice. I did. And um, so many... And again, I, I I did follow a advertising only strategy in my 30s, and I went through two long periods of unemployment. And my the central problem with that strategy is you're waiting to be picked. Yeah, uh, you're waiting for people, for the employers that interest you to post uh, positions. You're uh, you're waiting for a response to the application that you fire off. You're waiting for. Um, the people you interviewed with to let you know if you're going to advance to the next level. Uh, and so you, you're just, you, uh, you're, you're surrendering control over your search to other people. And you're not going to be, when you decide that instead you want to, uh, find and get these hidden jobs, um, it requires, it requires energy and effort on your part, but you have so much more choice and agency uh, than if you're just responding to postings. So it sounds like you're doing multiple things at once by creating these relationships and forming a network in the field that you're interested in and, you know, having your name come up when people think of, of when people are looking for someone. There, there are so many benefits to doing it this way rather than the other way. There are. And if I think... Um, Many of your listeners, if they reflect on it, and I know many of them are hiring managers or have been involved in hiring processes, um, think about how we uh, approach hiring. You know, we we will go through, we'll all publicly post a position, then we'll get the fifty, seventy five, hundred resumes, and if we see that we know somebody or there's some common tie, um, we'll pull that resume out. Uh, and consider it and read it more carefully. Or if somebody comes down the hall and says, hey, I know you're filling this position. I just got a call um, about Mary Smith. Uh, my colleague over at this other company says she's just great. You need to look at her resume. You pull Mary's resume out. And uh, you, uh, chances are, if she meets the qualifications, she's going to be one of the 10 or 15 people that get that first phone screen interview. And it may make it to the next stage. So there's a system here. Uh, and our, our challenge, again, when we're looking for work, is to understand how the system works and then make the system work for us. All right. That, that, uh, it sounds very strategic in a good way. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I find, I bet you too uh, do as well. Most people know what they want to do. And they know where they want to go or where they want to work. Where they get stuck is figuring out how to get there. And it's not because they aren't smart. It's because most of us just haven't had formal training and instruction in how to look for work and how to, how to manage our careers. 
Uh, but here's the good news. Um, you know, there's there's no shortage of resources out there. You can work with career coaches. You can get in touch with your university or college um, career services office. They'll work with both students and alums typically. Um, there are lots of books and courses. Um, and here's the other good news. Uh, the, once you master these skills, uh, and like any skill, you can learn them. Um, you know, we've all had to learn new things in our careers or, or uh, we all have personal interests or hobbies. And there's always that uncomfortableness in the beginning. But um, once you learn how to do it well, it's a means to an end. And the end really is getting the work that you enjoy and so that on Sunday night you're not dreading going into the office right. or wherever your occupation may be. Yeah, and I wish I wish that this was taught more widely to people because people waste so much time and effort. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We most of us. I I certainly had this experience. We learn it by how to look for work by trial and error, and and the the painful part is there's those periods of unemployment, and and even when you know how to do this well, there's always going to be rejection. You're not going to bat a thousand. You're you're not every application is going to lead to an interview. Uh, it's very much like sales, and sales is hard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the whole putting yourself out there is uh, is scary for some people. Some people have no problem with it, and other people have that uh, that feeling of, oh my goodness, I'm afraid to be rejected. You know, and it, like, as yeah. you say, it's like a skill you have to build up. Yeah, and I I think there are some people, a very very small number, for whom this comes naturally, but. Even the people who do it well and make it look effortless, they've gone through their own learning curve. And I, I say that because, again, it's natural to feel uncomfortable or, or for this might perhaps to seem over overwhelming, but it's like any skill. You, you can master it. Right. So what's your one last piece of advice for the listener? Don't wait to be picked. <laughs> um, yeah. Just be you inside, you know where you want to go and and tell people that and don't uh and then figure out a, a way to get there and 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 ask for help uh yeah the great thing about human beings is most of us really do want to help others we just uh we just need to have we need you when you make the request to make it very easy for us so yeah that would be my advice Fabulous. So, Mac, where can people find you? I know you've got a, a great book that you just wrote that I have a lovely copy of and I'm enjoying. <laughs> so uh, where can people find out more about you and what you do? We do have a new book. It's called Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. And it lays out uh, the uh, ideas and strategies that you and I've talked about today, Jen. People can find the first chapter for free by going to maxlist.org slash communication diva so we've spe set up a special landing page for your listeners there and and like you i host a podcast uh, and w it was a pleasure to have you come on the show and and every week we offer nuts and bolts advice about job hunting and it's called find your dream job or i'm sorry land your dream job uh, i'm sorry <laughs> okay. find your dream job and it's available on itunes and our website that's uh, that's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today, Mac. I know uh, you've got lots going on, and it's, as always, a pleasure speaking with you. And I'm so glad you uh, were able to share this with the Communication Diva audience. Well, thank you for having me on the show, Jen. Take care. You too. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation and got a lot out of it and now understand the best places to look for your great new job. So thank you to Mac and I will have all of the information on how to contact Mac over at the, I almost said it, <laughs> over at careersbygen.com in the show notes. And, uh, and you'll be able to find that there and uh, connect with Mac and see all the things that he and his organization are up to. That will be great. So again, thank you for taking the time to listen to this very last Communication Diva podcast episode. And uh, we'll be back next week with episode 151. And in the meanwhile, if you'd like to join our Facebook community, the name of that has changed as well, although you'll still be able to find it. And it is the Careers by Jen, J-E-N-N, -N, community. The Careers by Jen community on Facebook. Come on over. 
over. We have a growing number of amazing people in there. And uh, any topics related to careers um, are welcome and uh, people are talking to each other and it's a lot of fun. So come on over and check us out in the Facebook group. And until next time, take very good care.